I do want to recognize our presenter today and introduce her, Dr. Lori Schreiner. She's currently professor and chair of the Department of Higher Education at Azusa Pacific University, having spent over 30 years in higher education as a psychology professor and associate academic dean. Co-author of the Student Satisfaction Inventory that's used on over 1,600 campuses across the U.S. and Canada, as well as the Thriving Quotient that assesses college student well-being and success. Dr. Schreiner is co-author of Helping Sophomores Succeed, co-editor-in-chief of the journal Christian Higher Education, and serves on the editorial board of About Campus. She's published numerous journal articles and book chapters, has consulted with over 150 colleges and universities. She's an award-winning teacher and researcher, and her most recent work on college student thriving has studied over 30,000 students from 150 universities across the US, Canada, and Australia, and has led to numerous publications as well as the edited book Thriving in Transitions, a research-based approach to student success. So we're looking forward to it. Thank you, Dr. Schreiner. Thank you. Well, good morning. It's a pleasure to be here. And I noticed that the gong is right beside the podium. So hopefully no one will come up uh, and, and do this. I want to begin this morning. I'm not a morning person. <clears throat> And uh, you may not be either. So I want to begin this morning by actually having you start the session, OK? And I would, what I'd like you to do is to turn to someone at your table and introduce yourselves to one another, and then tell each other very quickly, I'm going to time you. You have a one minute for the whole exercise, introducing each other. And then how does your university define student success? Okay, how do they define success? Go. Your time is up. I told you it would be quick. <laughs> and the trick is always to get you to stop talking. So I'm going to come around. I have a microphone. So oftentimes when I'm just going to keep talking. And oftentimes when I do an exercise like this with my students, I will then ask them not what they said, but what they heard their partner say. And I'm going to have to come to the back of the room, because that's where it's getting noisy here. Hey. <laughs> All right, so what did you hear? I'm coming right for you, right here, right here. OK. <clears throat> what did you hear your partner say? Wow. Wow, look at that. I come all the way back here. Um. They're the main, what's this, whoa. Main college. Main college, uh, mostly medical profession, and they look at success in their students passing their boards. and Passing the boards. Years. Okay, what else did you hear? Graduation. Graduation, okay. What else? Minimal debt. Minimal debt. Say it again. Minimal debt. Minimal debt, okay. What else? Any other definitions of student success? You were talking a lot. <laughs> Level of civic engagement. Civic engagement, OK. And I saw another hand, I think, up here. Here I come. I have to say that um, my colleagues over here also are very student concern, not just graduation, but are they being successful? Are they? Make, are they learning other things than just 
good grades and uh, okay perfect, so more than their uh, perfect, grades perfect working into what you're going to talk about okay all right we hope <laughs> we hope there's that connection all right well a lot of times as we think about what helps um, or how we define success we tend to go with graduation rates right because that's what's easy to measure and so we look at graduation rates we might consider gpa we might say well i hope they're learning something we might talk about civic engagement or engagement in other activities that lead to learning and those are all great things that help uh, help us stay on track and set goals but here's the problem when we use success rates and define it solely as graduation, we have a problem. And that is that we see this consistent achievement gap in students who have been historically underserved by higher education compared to Caucasian and, and Asian students. This gap has not changed in 30 years. Okay, I could show that exact same slide from 30 years ago, and you don't have to change the numbers very much. So we are not being very successful with the student populations uh, that are becoming more and more a part of higher education. And it's even worse when we look at income status. So what we see is that there is a, a great disparity in the success rates of our low income versus higher income students. So let me give you an example of that. If you come from a high income family, so if, uh, an affluent family, but you didn't do so well on your SATs. So you're in the bottom quartile of SATs, okay? bottom. But your family is high income. You're in the top quartile of income status. You have a 30% chance of getting a college degree in your lifetime. Okay. Now, if you had that same low SAT score, but you came from a low income family, your odds drop to 6%. 6% chance of getting a college degree. Now, many of us might say, well, you're talking about the low SAT students. What about those high scorers? Well, let's take a look at them. If you score in the top quartile of the SAT and you come from a high income family, your odds have now gone up to 70% that you will get a college degree in your lifetime. Now, it ought to be the same for our low income students because we're talking about the top quartile of SAT. They have the ability. What do you think their odds are? Same? 26%. So the odds of getting a college degree are not even as good as the odds were for the bottom quartile SAT of high income families. So we have this disparity in income in terms of student success. And yet what we're seeing is that the growth that's going to happen in our new enrollment in the coming decade is going to come precisely from the groups that we have not been serving well. And that is low income students, who is primarily who we're not serving well, but also students of color. And that's where our growth is coming. That's what our future holds. So we have to find some new success strategies because what we have been doing for the last three decades has not worked. Now this is a retention conference and so we're gonna be focusing on how do we help our students get to graduation, but I would submit to you that it's not just getting them to graduation. It's also what kind of experiences are they having and what kind of life do they go on to lead? That's what our responsibility is beyond just getting them to cross the stage at graduation. And so my premise is that thriving should be our focus, that we for too long have been focusing just on survival. We haven't set our sights very high. When we start to look at thriving, we begin to look at things a little bit differently. So I'm a psychologist by training, and so as you look at this slide, um, the student success outcomes of learning and graduation, we typically have predicted that on the basis of behaviors. Are students engaging in behaviors that we know lead to learning and success and graduation? I wanted to know what was behind the behaviors. What 
gets a student to engage in those behaviors in the first place. If we know that sitting in the front of the room, we might say, well, that's a behavior that we associate with higher levels of learning, okay? So I'm looking at the front here, but <laughs> um, the learning's happening in the back today. Uh, but what we see is that sometimes who's sitting in the front is who came in late because it was the only seat left, right? <laughs> and so we cannot infer entirely from behavior that there is the psychological engagement. So I wanted to get behind the curtain and I wanted to say what is happening in terms of student motivation, in terms of the attitudes that students have that get them to engage in the behaviors that we know will help them learn and succeed. So this is a shift in perspective and uh, uh, Sandra said I've been doing this for a little more than, well, actually 35 years. This is my 35th year in higher education. But I want to say, for, just so you know, that I was 10 when I started. So, you know, just, just to clarify that. But what I found is I have spent my whole career as a, as a professor. So I love the teaching, but I love the research. And I've worked a, with a lot of institutions about retention. And I will simply say that after studying retention and student satisfaction for a couple of decades, I was feeling like something was missing, that we had missed an element that might be helpful to us. I realized we were in a paradigm that emphasized minimal performance survival. We were looking at things that were not very changeable in a student. We were looking at their high school background, their demographics, um, family house or household income, things that we just couldn't change about students. And we were spending a lot of time identifying their deficits finding all the things they couldn't do, all the ways they weren't prepared for college, and we were spending most of our time trying to fix them. And I found that being in this kind of failure prevention mode was not very energizing. You get discouraged after a while. And so when I started thinking, what is this missing piece? I was watching students cross the stage at graduation. And I thought, now, you know, now, every single one of them that crosses the stage is considered a success by us. And yet, as I knew some of those students, they had had very different experiences and they were going on to very different lives. And I thought, there's a piece that's missing and that is who has made the most of their college experience? Who has really leaned into their potential and, and kind of come alive intellectually and personally as a result of the college experience? And so by shifting the, the paradigm or the perspective to thriving, we start focusing on possibilities, on who our students can become and what kind of life they can create for themselves. We start focusing on the talents that they bring to us, the contribution that they can make to our learning environment, and we find ways of building on that. And so we become in the success promotion business rather than failure prevention. And I will simply say it's a lot more energizing for me both in the classroom and in my interactions with students to think about myself as promoting their success rather than simply preventing their failure. So as I started thinking about what this means to be fully engaged and energized and making the most of the college experience, we thought that there were likely three elements to this or three domains. And that is certainly there's the academic component. There's this piece of, of coming alive intellectually, being energized intellectually. But we also thought there were likely to be relational aspects or interpersonal aspects as well as psychological aspects, ways of looking at the world. We began our research actually by interviewing students who had been nominated by faculty or by fellow students as that's somebody who's really thriving, who's really making the most of their college experience. And we asked these students to tell us their stories. Then we went into the literature and looked for what we knew about student success already and tried to find ways of, of measuring that in a reliable way. So we used 
what researchers would call the, the inductive method, interviewing a lot of students and saying what's bubbling up from those conversations. But we also used a deductive method, and that is what are the theories of student success? What do we already know about what works? And how can we begin to measure that? And that's where the thriving quotient came from, is really a result of both of those processes. So we have used it on well over 30,000 students. It is a research instrument, so it's free, uh, available to anybody who wants to use it. And we have found it to consistently produce very reliable, valid indicators of five particular elements of what we have labeled thriving. And the, and the construct validity of it would say that there is this element of thriving that is more than just these five scales that make up the instrument, but that there is this construct, this thing called thriving that is more than just adding up all the different scales. So let me tell you a little bit about how this then affects what we know about our student outcomes. You might recognize Aston's IEO model, inputs, environment, and outcomes. And this is the traditional research in higher education to say what is it that predicts student success outcomes. And so we know, for instance, that students' demographic characteristics actually pr uh, predict quite a bit of the success outcomes. And then our hope is that these campus experiences, high impact practices and student faculty interaction, campus involvement, leadership experiences, those kinds of things, that they also will make the difference and they certainly contribute to the variation that we see in the outcomes. So that's the traditional model. In this model, again, who you are before you walk in the door it contributes most of the variation in your outcomes. And that is your gender, your race or ethnicity, and your household income are big predictors of your likelihood of succeeding in college. Now what I wanted to know is what would happen if we put into the equation a new variable? If we said, but what happens when students thrive? Does that change the outcome at all? And what we see in our research time and time again is that when we put thriving in the equation, and that is we're asking students these uh, items about these five elements of their college life that I'm about to explain to you, when we get their feedback on that and we determine that a student is in fact thriving as a result of their campus experiences, the demographic characteristics are no longer predictive of success. Now what that means, and the good news of that, is that our students are no longer doomed by their demographics. That it doesn't matter where you come from, it doesn't matter your family background, it doesn't matter how well your high school prepared you or not. If we can create campus experiences that help our students thrive, then they will be able to succeed. And that's why I think we need to expand this vision of what it takes for students to be successful and to think about retention strategy. It's not just of, of getting them to graduation, but how do we help them really come alive to all the possibilities that exist for them in the college experience. So I think of thriving because I think of uh, things blossoming a lot, and I'm not the best gardener in the world, so I will, I will say that, I'm, but I'm a very attracted to what happens in the gardens, and I love beautiful gardens, and so I think of thriving as really that, that blossoming that can happen uh, in a student's experience. So let me tell you a little bit about each of these components. So one aspect of thriving academically is when you are engaged in the learning process. So you are making connections. It is what John Tagg calls deep learning. You are investing energy in the learning process. You are finding ways it connects to what you're interested in, what your goals are in life, what you're learning in other classes. You're finding ways to apply it. And then that creates the significant learning that lasts beyond the final exam. And that's what all of us want to see in our students, is this engagement in learning that lasts beyond a particular course. So that is one element. Thriving students are energized by learning. And that's what we want to see. 
A second aspect of thriving students is the factor that we call academic determination. And this is comprised, if we were to describe thriving students, they are hard workers. They regulate their own learning. So if they don't understand something, they go back and read it again, or they go for the help that they need. They are motivated to reach their goals. They're managing their time and their resources well. And primarily, they know the strengths that they have and how to use them to be successful. This is the dominant element of this particular aspect of thriving, that they know the strengths that they bring to the learning environment. They know how to use that or how to apply it to academic tasks. Now, the relational part of thriving is comprised of two elements, that we, one of which we call diverse citizenship. So a thriving student recognizes that differences create a more enriching learning experience. So they value difference but they also want to make a difference in the world. So when students are thriving, they are engaged with other people. As we interviewed students, they told us over and over again, it's not just about me. I know I'm thriving when I'm giving back, is what we heard over and over again from our students. But they also described this social connectedness that they were involved in healthy relationships, that they had the kind of support that they needed so that they were not feeling lonely. They found it fairly easy to make friends on campus, and they found that there were people who would listen to them and support them. But probably the foundation to thriving, the foundational scale, is what we ended up calling positive perspective. Now what this is, is actually optimism, or what we call an optimistic explanatory style. Optimistic people are different in the way they handle negative events. And so what we find is this is very teachable. In fact, all of these elements are teachable to students, and that's, that's the good part of this as well. So people who have this sense of realistic optimism know that in the end, things are likely to work out. Notice it's a long term. So it's a realistic optimism. It's not everything's going to be fine right now. <laughs> but it is eventually things will be OK. And we have to just keep saying that to ourselves during this election season, right? Eventually. <laughs> maybe in another four years, <laughs> no, but uh, eventually things will be okay. So there is this long-term view about how things are likely to turn out. And what that leads them to do then is to see failure as a temporary setback. So when you interview people who are successful in life, what you'll find is that the vast majority of them, when you ask them, tell me how you got to be successful, they start with a story about failure. Invariably they do, because they will talk about how they dealt with that, how they turned that around to success. This is the piece that's very teachable to our students. Uh, Marty Seligman calls it um, a learned optimism. Okay. And there are strategies for teaching it to every student who walks through our door. And I think that's the other piece that I want to emphasize this morning is that thriving is malleable. There's a lot of emphasis right now on psychosocial factors. There's a great book out by Angela Duckworth called Grit, and we hear a lot about grit. You need to be careful with grit because it's highly correlated with a personality characteristic or trait called conscientiousness. So when we're talking about personality traits, those are not things that change very often across a lifetime. They're very stable. And my fear is as we begin looking at these psychosocial characteristics that we will start selecting students on the basis of them, that we'll start admitting the grittiest students rather than saying, what can we do once you're already on our campus to really help you thrive? So every aspect of thriving is something that is state, not trait. It's things that the research has demonstrated we can change with intervention, okay? Now, in the pathways to thriving, as we think about, so what helps students 
thrive on our campuses, there are five particular pathways that I, that I want to tell you a little bit about and then have you interact with a bit. So these five pathways are things, again, that we know are significant contributors to whether a student is likely to thrive on campus. So a pathway toward thriving might be their involvement in campus activities or their interactions with faculty or their own level of spirituality, and I'll define that in a moment. The degree to which they are aware of and developing their strengths and then the sense of community on campus. The difficult piece to this, however, is that when we do our predictive models of thriving, what we find is that students who are not part of the cultural majority on campus have fewer pathways, fewer pathways to thriving than majority students do. And the pathways differ even across uh, ethnic groups. So we'll see that, that there are different patterns and different pathways to thriving for uh, each of the major racial and ethnic groups that we have disaggregated out of the data. Now what comes from that is that, the, or the lesson from that, because when you're dealing with 30,000 students, it's easy to see those patterns. When you're dealing with an individual student, you would never make a judgment about them based on that category. Please hear me on that. It's big patterns and trends that we see in the data. But in working with individual students, you always want to hear their story and where they're coming from to understand the pathways that are going to help them thrive. So let's talk a bit about campus involvement because what we see is that it is the majority students on campus who benefit most from that. It's a major pathway. Uh, on a predominantly white campus, for instance, it's a major pathway for our white students to thrive. And we see it's less of a pathway. It's almost a restricted pathway for some, and then it's not even a pathway at all for other students who are not part of the majority. So as we think about how do we help all of our students access this pathway, that's the message I want you to hear from this, is not to say, oh, there aren't pathways for certain students. There aren't pathways because we haven't created them as the institution. Okay. So what we need to do is to begin to see if this is a pathway for our majority students, how do we help it become a pathway for all of our students? So as we think about how we help campus involvement be positive and to help students thrive, I want to put the idea of invitation out to you. And that is too often we tend to create programs and services and it's like a, a, a big buffet or smorgasbord. Here it is, we're gonna have all of these things for you, but you have to come take advantage of them. Invitation says, I go out to students and I say, you know what, given what I know about you, I think you would really enjoy participating in this activity or to be part of this organization. It's when we invite our students to participate and invite their input into how we design the programs and services and invite them into leadership opportunities that we begin to see this pathway open up for all of our students. When we can connect their involvement to future goals, we find that that, and we would say it's selective campus involvement, and that is, it's not just get involved. It's finding the right kind of involvement that connects with the goals that you have. It's encouraging our students to engage in peer mentoring and leadership opportunities. And because there are hurdles for students who commute and for students who work, and we know in our large-scale research that that tends to disadvantage our low income and students of color. And so to say, let's pay attention to when we are offering things and to how available our activities and services and programs are for students who have to get home uh, to fix dinner for their family and cannot stay on campus in the evening or for those who are working. Now the second pathway is when we find ways to connect students with faculty. 
And again, here is where we see that a lot of research has been done on student-faculty interaction, and we would say, oh, this is a major way to help students succeed, is that they need to be connected to faculty. Well, the research that Carol Lundberg and I have done and that Darnell Cole has also done says, it, this only helps if the relationship or the interaction is rewarding. And what we find, for instance, is our African-American students on predominantly white campuses are interacting with faculty more than anyone else, and they are benefiting the least. They are not seeing payoffs because those interactions are not positive in many cases. And so finding ways to have positive, high quality, not just frequent, but high quality interactions among students and faculty is the secret here. And to say what is happening in these interactions. So the research uh, that some of my doctoral students have done has looked at what these interactions are about and when they are most positive. And what they found is that when the conversation focuses on the future and helps the student see what they can become and what their life could look like, this painting a picture of the future, that that is a positive interaction with faculty as is when the dialogue is around academic content, not just how are you doing in the class, not just performance, but it's about the ideas in class. When what faculty convey to students is this belief in them, what, what we might say is a growth mindset, or Laura Rendon refers to validation, this saying to students uh, and communicating to them, you deserve to be here and of saying, I believe in you. Those are key messages that when we have interviewed, we interviewed 92 high-risk students who had been admitted to their institution on probation, provisionally admitted, and yet two years later, they all had um, GPAs of at least 2.5, so they were successful by the institution's um, designation, and we interviewed 92 of them and said, what helped you be successful? Particularly on community college campuses, every single student at a community college said it was because there was a faculty or staff member who believed in me. On four-year campuses, about 80% of the students also said that, and they named names. 70% of them named faculty. 30% of them named staff. And they said, this was someone, and one of the quotes we used in this uh, research article was, she believed in me before I believed in myself. And that when it's that kind of attitude that was coming through in the relationship with faculty, that's when it really made a difference. We also know that when we think about research partnerships, it's a high impact practice. So uh, we're certainly encouraged to do that. But the research shows, guess who benefits most from that? It's your sophomores and students of color. That's who benefits most from research partnerships. And by benefit, I mean they are, it has the biggest effect on them going on to graduate and go on to graduate school. And yet many faculty want to work with our seniors, right? <laughs> the students that we know have what it takes, but it's when we take time with our sophomores and, and particularly with students of color that we are seeing huge benefits from this research partnership between faculty and students. Now spirituality is the third uh, pathway and I wanna explain a little bit about what we mean by that. This is not religiosity. It is not religious beliefs, but it is a feeling of meaning and purpose in life, a sense of transcendence, that there's more to life than just about me, that there is, is some kind of higher purpose to life, and that these beliefs that I have about meaning and purpose provide a lens through which I see my life and give me some comfort uh, when things are difficult. So it's a coping resource, a lens, a source of meaning and purpose. And what we saw is that it was the major superhighway to thriving for our students of color, number one pathway for our black students. And so thinking about how are we beginning to, uh, how could we capitalize on that? We tend to actually ignore that pathway. We see it as private, 
uh, perhaps particularly on public, in public institutions, we might say, well, there's separation of church and state. We really shouldn't be talking about this. But again, this is not about religious beliefs. It's about meaning and purpose. Okay? And that when we have conversations, whether that's in advising, whether that's in a mentoring relationship, whether it's just someone stopping by my office, that we're willing to engage in dialogue with students about their doubts, their struggles for meaning and purpose of trying to figure out what life is all about. But I do think it means that we might consider partnering with faith-based organizations and thinking of ways that they might be of support, additional t support to our students who might be overlooked uh, otherwise. Are we creating sacred space on campus for meditation and quiet, reflection for all of our students? And when we have diversity celebrations and training, are we including interfaith observances in that process? So are we recognizing that we are dealing with whole persons and that all of us have a spiritual aspect to our personhood, that it's not just about academics and um, interpersonal relationships. So the, the next pathway that I think is one of the things that can certainly lead to individual thriving is what we call strengths development. When we take this very active way of thinking about what our students bring to our campuses and how we can nurture the talents that they bring. So what I want you to do, you talked to someone earlier, so I want you to find another neighbor at your table, introduce yourself to them, and here's your, your challenge in the next one minute. What energizes you most about your work? Now, the way you might think about this is what part of your work would you do for free? Okay, go. All right, time is up. Now, some of you may have felt the need to tell your entire work history. <laughs> but as you think about what energizes you, and when I'm asked that question, I often say that what energizes me most about the work that I do is teaching. So the teaching is what I would do for free, and um, don't tell my provost that. Teaching is what I would do for free, but I've decided what I get paid the big bucks to do is grading papers, right? That's all of my salary goes to that. Well, what you just talked about, as you shared what energizes you, are clues to your own strengths, of the things that you do well and that energize you. That's what we mean by these talents that we then develop into strengths. So the most fulfilling times of your life have probably been when you were playing to your strengths, when you felt like, ah, oh, I was born to do this. Um, I love this. I can't believe I get paid to do this. And hopefully you have those experiences, at least weekly. Uh, Marcus Buckingham would say a good job is when 75% of the time you feel that way about the work you do. Good question, huh? But our paradigm, again, in higher education is to remediate deficits. And we say, well, there are certain skills you simply have to have, and we're going to measure those when you walk in the door. And if we find that you're deficient in any of these areas, then guess where you're going to spend most of your time this year? Now, I don't know about you, but if this happened to me in a job, I don't know how long I would stay. So let's suppose my provost says, you know, you've got the job, okay, but we have these tests that we want you to take, and uh, then we'll sit down and talk with you. And so I get my test results back, I sit down with the provost, and he says, well, all right, there's there's some good news and bad news. The good news is you're really good at teaching and that's why we hired you. Bad news is you are not very organized. In fact, we've looked at your office and you tend to be a piler rather than a filer, okay? Do I have any uh, pilers in the room? Yes, okay, oh, thank goodness. <laughs> Pilers, and, and there's actually an article in Scientific American that 
shows this to be very true. Pilers have different brains than filers. And if you try to make me into a filer, you are messing with the synapses in my brain. And yes, I am, tr it, is, it, it, it is scientifically supported, okay? So, absolutely. And so what happens when you make us file is we put things away and they're gone. I don't think about them anymore. And so the piles help me remember. And my piles, I know exactly. I know exactly what's in my piles. And if you ask me for something, I know which pile to go into. But let's suppose my university doesn't like pilers. And they want everyone to be a filer because they think that's what's going to help us be successful. I could go to filing classes all day. And I might get better at it. But I will never be world class. I will never be excellent at filing. And I sure as heck am not going to be motivated. And, and we would not stay in environments like that. If my provost said, you don't have to teach the whole first year because you're going to be in filing classes, <laughs> I would not stay. And yet we are perplexed at our students' lack of motivation. We say, what's wrong with them? Why aren't they motivated? Look at how we're treating them. We are asking them to spend most of their time in their areas of weakness that drain them. Now, I'm not saying we don't have to pay attention to areas where they need to improve, because we do. But it's the way in which we come about that. If we instead said to them, here are your talents, and we want you to spend most of your time in that area, and we're going to show you how to use your talents to read faster or with greater comprehension. Or we're going to build on those talents to do math at the level you need to do math to be successful here. So it's the philosophy behind it that requires this paradigm shift. Because I can spend uh, time in my areas of weakness, and it, I will never, I will never get excellent, and I will not be motivated. And our chief challenge in higher education is how to motivate and engage our students. So when we think about a strengths philosophy or strengths development, instead of saying here is one path, a successful student takes notes like this, studies like this, writes like this, solves problems like this, we simply are saying we want you to be the best version of yourself, and we will teach you how to do that. It's not saying everything's fine exactly the way you are, and we all sing Kumbaya, but it's saying, no, I see the talents you have, and we're going to build on that to help you reach your full potential. When that happens, when we're focused on strengths development, that's where individual thriving can happen. So we can measure the talents and strengths students have that help them be competent, but it's also important to recognize that there are strengths of character and that those are important elements in thriving as well. A strength we are defining as a, a competence strength would be something that you do consistently with excellence. And it begins with this talent that you have already inside you, but it also is what energizes you. And then that gets multiplied by the knowledge and skills that our students gain by being in college with us. So it starts with these talents, this two-second way of seeing the world of processing information or interacting with people. So as you walked into the room this morning and perhaps you saw you know, hundreds of people you didn't know, some of you, your two second reaction was, look at all the friends I haven't met yet, right? You might have that woo <laughs> talent. Others of you looked around the room and said, oh, there are some people sitting by themselves. I don't want them to feel bad or feel lonely. I'm gonna go sit with them. And so that two-second talent you have is to include people who are on the margins. Others of you came with a team and said, oh, there's my department chair. Seems to be in a pretty good mood. Maybe I can sit by her and have a budget discussion, okay? So strategic is the way, is the talent you bring into the room. It's this two-second reaction. All of our students bring talents into the room. 
natural ways that have helped them be successful in the past. And so our trick is to figure out and help them figure out what has helped you be successful. You wouldn't be in college if you hadn't had some success. So what helped you? And how can we replicate that in these years that you're with us? So a talent, this predisposition or two second way that you have of processing information has to be multiplied by this investment of effort. And that is the other teachable part of this. We can teach our students the role that effort plays in their success. And that is what creates a strength, is this effort that multiplies the talent into consistent excellence. So it is not just about what do you bring to the table, it's also about developing those talents into strengths that lead our students toward excellence. Ken Bain has written a book, if you haven't read it, I highly recommend it. Um, he wrote it in 2004 called What the Best College Teachers Do. He's also written a book called What the Best College Students Do, and I highly recommend that. Uh, in giving it to students even to say that here are all the secrets um, of the successful students. But Ken Bain, what he found in these best of the best college professors is that they had this ability to look for the talent. They saw students capabilities and they believed that students were in fact able to learn and they had this faith in them and this trust in them and this respect for where students were coming from. So if strengths development is the major pathway toward thriving as an individual student, thriving as a campus really comes down to creating this sense of community on campus. So I want you to uh, perhaps around your tables, I'm going to give you a whole two minutes now, but I want you to brainstorm words you would use to describe a thriving campus, not a student, but a campus, okay? So I'm gonna give you two minutes to brainstorm as many words, and if somebody would jot them down or remember them, that'd be great. All right, I'm gonna ask a couple of you to share some of the words that came up at your table. Let's see if I can get anybody to have eye contact with me here. Let's see. Hi. Hi. Uh, so at our table. Oh, is it on? Here. Thank you. Uh, so at our table, we talked about uh, uh, a thriving campus being intentional, energetic, collaborative, uh, personable, being having a lot of opportunities, being experientially based, um, people having confidence, there being kind of a communal responsibility, uh, an awareness um, of both of individual needs but also of campus needs. Um, yeah. Wow. Do you want to like just go up there and finish this? Take it home. Uh, yeah. Sure. Sure. Yeah. 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 Yeah, so what we see is a lot of good qualities there. Let's see if we, do we have another one or? We got it, we got it going now. All right, who else had some, any, 
anything different than that amazing list, okay? I think in a nutshell, the interactivity, but a shared purpose. Shared purpose, okay. She don't wanna talk, but um, we said green, having greenery around the area. Okay, so lots of things blooming. So it's a very green campus, okay. <laughs> Another one we mentioned was um, a more engaged administration. Okay, okay. And engage, so the engagement is happening not just with students, but also all the way up through uh, administration. Anything else? Of course, let's come over here. That's okay. I don't have a word, but just a quick thought of um, a a safe space where we provide students to practice the skills needed to learn rather than having the focus be on the outcome of what they learned. Yeah. If there's a way for us to assess and encourage the messiness of learning so that the, we give them time to learn how to learn as opposed to just the content of what right. they're learning. Right. And then I think along with that is the requirement of us as faculty and administrators to be trained to allow that to happen. Okay, all right. So thinking about the kind of environments that we create, and I, I grew up, we are in the South, I grew up in Tennessee, uh, just across the way, and there was a saying when I was growing up, if mama ain't happy, ain't nobody happy. Mm-hmm, yep. And uh, when we apply that to higher education, I think it's often if faculty <laughs> ain't happy, ain't nobody happy. So we would say that a thriving campus is not just about our students, but is also about our faculty, our staff, our administrators, the kind of environment we're creating. Here's the thing, the major pathway, the strongest contributor to thriving for all students is a psychological sense of community on campus. Now let me explain what I mean by that and how then it is the foundational element to a thriving campus. So a sense of community is a feeling that I belong, that I am a contributing member of a campus and that I am in relationship with people who care about me and who will support me, but also whom I can support. We know that people who have a strong sense of community take fewer sick days, so they are not sick as often. They are more productive. They do not become uh, not only just physically ill, but they do not uh, suffer from mental disorders at the same level. It is one of the most amazing buffers that we can create to help our students who often are feeling very stressed out and, um, and experiencing struggle on our campus. Are we creating a sense of community? So these four elements of a sense of community, I want you to think about your own campus and think, do we do this? So the membership component is what do you do that signals to students that they are in fact a member of your campus, that they belong, and that it's not just welcome, but it's also being a full member of the community. I, I asked a student of mine a number of years ago, I said, do you feel welcome here? She was a, a Latina student. I said, do you feel welcome on this campus? And she looked at me and she said, Laurie, I have been here three years. When you use the word welcome, you're acting like it's your house. It's my house too. So I think that when we use welcome, we are conveying that it's our house and that students are our guests, rather than saying, we want you to be part of us and we want you to feel that this is your home too and that you are a contributing member. When there, uh, one of the ways that psychologists would tell the sense of community on your campus would be to walk through your campus and to see how many students are wearing anything with logo, because that says I'm proud to be a member here. Uh, in the days of bumper stickers, we might go through the uh, parking lot and to look at how many bumper stickers or license plate holders have the university logo. Those are things that say I'm proud to be identified with this place. And that's the first step, but students also need to feel that they have a voice and that their input makes a difference, that they have something to contribute and that they really matter to us. 
and that's the ownership piece. And this would be true also for staff and faculty. This is not just students. So we would be asking these questions of our faculty and staff as well. Then the relationship component is, do I have connections, opportunities to uh, connect with other people? Do we celebrate with one another? Um, do we support one another during difficult times? Is there an emotional connection? Um, Barbara Fredrickson has done some research on how positive emotions help the productivity of an institution. And so for every negative emotion that you have, it tends to constrict your thinking and it, it interferes with your problem solving. When you have positive emotions, it opens up those channels of creativity and complex problem solving. You need three positive emotions to counteract one negative one. So think about your interactions in a given day. Are you at a three to one ratio? for positive to negative. If you're married, it's six to one in your marriage relationship, okay? <laughs> Just a little word to the wise there, you know. You gotta step it up a little bit more on that. So these emotional connections build relationships that help our students and faculty and staff feel like this is a place I belong. And see, I wanna stay in a place where I feel at home. The partnership piece is when we find ways of working together toward goals that are bigger than what we could accomplish as individuals. So it creates this kind of synergy or shared goals. Common purpose was one of the things I heard you say. And those are aspects of sense of community. When our students feel a sense of community, it explains more than half of the variation in their thriving. So it is something that costs us nothing. And yet, in, and in all of the predictive models we've used, it also predicts whether students uh, feel that their tuition is worthwhile, whether they intend to graduate. It's a major predictor of a lot of what uh, is contributing to student success. Now, one of the other things to consider as we think about this sense of community is John Braxton and his colleagues at Vanderbilt have studied something called institutional integrity, which is this delivering on your promises, portraying the institution accurately through admissions, having faculty and staff who embody the mission or walk the talk, as we might say, and meeting our students' expectations. So what we've found is that this is, this feeds a sense of community as well. It's a key contributor to sense of community for all of our students and especially our underrepresented students. It's a major contributor to whether they feel like they belong on campus, whether they feel that sense of community. So these are the three, again, if faculty and staff are seen as walking the talk, if expectations are met, and if students feel like the campus was accurately portrayed, or as they sometimes say to us, I got to campus and discovered that every student of color had been on the brochure, right? So how do we portray ourselves in, in the admissions process? And do students come on campus and go, whoa, this wasn't what I was expecting at all? When that happens, they feel that uh, it's a matter of integrity, and then they are not likely to feel this sense of community that helps them thrive and that then predicts their success. So my question to you would be, what are the promises that you think your institution is making to students through the admissions process, through uh, all aspects of, of um, the learning experience, and are you breaking any of those promises with certain student groups? So as we think about thriving as a campus, and you hit many of the adjectives that we would use to describe a thriving campus, I would go back to our initial research on thriving to say that it has these academic and psychological and interpersonal elements. So as we think about how might we thrive together on our campus, how can we be stronger together, we might, not to get a little political there, but, <clears throat> I think first of all, we would start psychologically, and that is, how do we create this environment that brings out the best in our students and in ourselves? How do we identify our students' 
assets when they walk in the door and how do we build on that? And it's a philosophical approach. Yes, there are instruments out there, but it's more about is, do we look for talent? Do we assume the best in each other? Do we promote success in our students? Do we promote flourishing in our colleagues? Are we looking for the best? Our research has shown that when we measure students' optimism. We don't need to measure their levels of resilience or hope or any of these other psychological factors because what we find is an optimistic student is a resilient student. And so we know that we are building our students' re resilience when we identify their strengths and then help them develop that. So that's the first, is to say, how do we create this kind of environment that brings out the best? Academically, we do exactly as you were describing uh, over there to my right, and that is we put learning squarely at the center of everything we do. And by that, we mean the learning process. Learning as mastery, not as performance, not as GPA. Because actually, we have found that our, our top GPA students have the lowest levels of engaged learning. That's one of the sad things we found in our research. And when we talk to these students and say, wait a minute, <laughs> you're getting straight A's. How can you say you're not engaged in learning? And they'll say, it's a choice I have to make. Because to get the A, I have to follow directions and find out what the professor expects and deliver it on time. That may or may not coincide with engaging in learning. If I actually engaged in learning, it might not look the way the professor said it had to look in the syllabus. It might not get delivered on time. It might take me longer and take me down different roads. And so we found that, that our best of the best students had some of the lowest levels of engagement. So I think we have to put learning back at the center of what we do, the learning process, this kind of deep learning that lasts beyond a given course. And we should use it to make decisions. What would happen differently on your campus if before any building was built, or any money was spent, the question everyone at the table asked was, how does this help our students learn and grow? We would make far different decisions, I think. So putting learning at the center means we make our decisions differently, looking for what helps our students learn. But it also means that we do not stay in our silos. That is faculty, and staff, student life professionals in particular, begin to work together to really form partnerships, recognizing that learning doesn't just happen in the classroom, but it happens beyond the classroom, and that, that it takes a village, it takes all of us to create these kind of seamless learning experiences for our students. And then the relational piece of thriving, I think, is when we focus on a sense of community on campus and think, how are we helping people feel that they belong, that they have a voice, that they're connected to us, and that we have work to do together? When those things happen, I think that's when we have a thriving campus. So, in conclusion, when we think about our thriving students, our goal is to equip them to flourish for a lifetime to engage in this lifelong learning that meets their goals, that they remain connected to other people in healthy ways, that they remain optimistic about their future and contributing to their community and to the society as a whole. That's our goal as we think about what it means for our students to thrive. And when our students thrive, I think all of us will be thriving as well. If you are interested in participating in our thriving project, which simply means access to the instrument, again, it's, it's free if you want more information about it, I'm happy to answer questions, and you can also uh, check out the website. I think we have about five minutes for, for some questions, so if you have questions, but thank you very much for your time and attention today. We have a couple of microphones, so if you have questions, and then also I am staying here for the following session, just for informal conversation or Q&A then as well. So, what questions do you have? I see one right here. 
Um, do you see the same elements show up with transfer students as well? Yes. So, so what we have found in our research over and over again is whether we are, are exploring or assessing students at any class level, we also have um, measured adult returning learners, transfer students, community college, four-year institutions, graduate students, thriving is thriving. So those elements of thriving do not change. What changes are the pathways, okay? So for transfer students, sense of community becomes even more important because they're trying to find their way through uh, and navigate an, a new campus. And so we see that some of those pathways are a little bit different for transfer students. Um, the elements that lead to thriving st are still there, but they, are of a, they just are weighted differently. Uh, same thing goes with first year students um, versus sophomores. So for sophomores, for instance, meaning and purpose is huge because that's part of what's going on in the sophomore years. They're trying to figure that out. So we see that that's a major pathway. So the pathways are what change by student population. What thriving is does not change um, across all the populations that we've studied so far. All right, thank you very much. I, did you have another question? Oh, sorry, she was walking over that way. Well, we'll do one more. I was looking at Sandra who said we need to be done. Okay, Hi. one more. Where, where do students' financial situations come into thriving? So students who don't want to take out loans or need to progress at a certain speed in order to maintain their financial aid. Yeah, so the, the financial piece, what was interesting to us because we, in, we started off with almost 200 items and our models had financial elements in it. What we found is that when you assess the, the psychological element and whether students perceive that their tuition is a worthwhile investment, that is the issue. Do they feel that they are getting their money's worth? Do they feel like this is, has been a good investment for them? That that tends to be the issue rather than um, how much financial aid they have. And not that those things aren't important, but we find they didn't distinguish or didn't enable us to predict the success outcomes to the same degree that the psychological piece did. So thank you, and I'm happy to stay into the next session. Thanks. <laughs>